Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome everybody um, to the latest in our series of Masterclass Conversations sponsored by Beyond Pulse. Um, delighted to be joined today by Mr. Chris Paniotu, who is the Virginia Rush Developmental Director of Coaching and is Rush Soccer's Grassroots Technical Director. In addition to these extravagant titles, uh, Mr. Chris P is also a dear friend of all of us at, at Beyond Pulse, and uh, Chris, we're delighted to have you here today. Thank you for yeah. joining us. Tom, pleasure and an honor to be uh, with the Beyond Pulse people. Thank you, my man. Um, Chris, you have, in my opinion, one of the, uh, the most important roles within our industry. Um, and what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, is just get a little bit of background on, on you, um, your journey to this point, and then specifically, you know, what, what made you fall in love with, you know, working with the youngest players and, uh, you know, the kind of the grassroots level of the game and, you know, where did, where did that passion stem from? Yeah, brilliant. So I'll unpack it slowly there. Um, but, uh, you know, my journey started born and raised in England, obviously to Greek Cypriot parents, first one in my family, like yourself, Tom, to go through university and get a degree, um, certified physical education teacher for the secondary school level. Started coaching at the age of 17, was one of the youngest ones to get my FA prelim um, yeah. and then went on, came over to the States for the first time in 1994 doing summer camps and it was like a whole different language. Although the Americans say they speak English or us Americans, I should say now that I'm a citizen, um, it, was, uh, it was a whole new ball game. You know, put your cleats on, get on the field. Um, I remember watching the 94 final in a Cowboys house um shouting some quite obscenities when Baggio missed the penalty so it was it was a very um it was a baptism of fire per se um but then you know stayed over stayed over here and you know I was challenged about 10 or 12 years ago everybody wanted to work with travel kids and the best kids and nobody really wanted to realize what it took into put into consideration what does it take to develop that player at the highest level, where do they start from? Where do they yeah. go out? So one of my mentors over 10 years ago said to me, um, a guy called Dr. Roy Patton, he says, can you specialize in the six through 12s? You know, the golden ages, you know, zone one as we're calling it now. Yeah. Um, and I, I had the knack, Tom, of being able to work with any age group. So for example, working with under sixes and then going to work with an under 15 group, I had the ability to be able to switch over yep. switch personas per se um, and then get into what they needed and what they needed from me and what we could help them get um, really enjoyed working in the zone one and then you know did my um, national youth license through the federation when it was being done and tom goodman and sam snow were the instructors who you know uh, are legends in u.s youth soccer per se Absolutely. yep and then um you know, just carried on and just had ideas about how children learn, what's fun, um, and how to keep players engaged um, and keep them coming back. And more importantly, make them fall in love with the sport to maybe become lifelong engaged participants or even become coaches later on themselves. Yeah, look, I, th I think that's it's it's a fascinating a fascinating insight and some some really. I guess some really pertinent points that I kind of look to draw upon as we as we delve a little bit deeper into the conversation. But um, Chris, can you explain to me because I think the the phrase developmentally appropriate coaching it's there's a little bit of jargon in that. What, yeah. what does it what does it mean to you? Like when you when you deep dive into it at these youngest stages, you know what is developmentally appropriate coaching for so, six or eight year olds? I think, brilliant, good question, Tom. I think that. Developmentally appropriate to me means it's appropriate to the child for the age and stage of development they're in. So, for example, um, a six-year-old, developmentally appropriate looks different to an eight-year-old. And that's simply because at five and six, children don't have their inner thigh muscle developed, so they can't pass a ball, yet most of the adults tell them pass, pass, pass. So, for me, we've got to get inside what's it like to be that age do remember being that age and everything's like storytelling and appropriate to their world. Right. Um, so whether it's dinosaurs, whether it's, um, it used to be blues clues at one stage. And now I think it's, uh, it's uh, Paw Patrol and uh, Peppa Pig 
and just you know getting in using their imagination and using your imagination to allow them to be creative within a framework of what you want what you want out of the session but most importantly what they want out of the session so long-winded but specifically age and stage of development that the child may may be in and what are their needs and before we get into what a kind of session structure and culture should be maybe thinking about in terms of how they deliver to that age group is there any is there any recommendations you can share in terms of uh, you know i think the fact that you said you you were willing and and able to to almost transform yourself into being the coach that the players needed and sometimes i think as coaches we can be a little afraid somewhat of um putting ourselves in i guess maybe embarrassing situations or you know definitely acting in a way that might be somewhat uncomfortable is there any kind of tips you can give to people at, at, at this age group about but leave your kind of egos at the door and you know what what was kind of the, the most yeah the most pertinent kind of advice you've had from from that perspective it, it's, it's quite simple i would just say if your energy levels and your enthusiasm can exceed theirs then you, you're going to be into a winner right you're going to be onto a winner um i start almost every single one of our coaches meetings uh, and coach development meetings with raise your hand if you were once a child and that gets a giggle out of everyone i stole that yeah. from uh you know the magic academy rusty yeah. uh, earnshaw and uh richard richard cheatham right so what that does automatically is it puts people ah they can put their shoulders back if you're watching body language um yeah. the other things i would tell people is is if you're coaching you sixes kneel down get to their eye level uh, and i do say that comes with a warning because then you become a climbing frame um little simple things if you're wearing sunglasses uh take them off so you can see the children um, and just little tidbits of can when you're talking to them, can your instruction be short? If you they say experts say that if, if they're six years old, you get two seconds per, per year. So you have 12 seconds to get your explanation going. Um, children will also tell you if something's boring or if you're talking too long. Um, so, true. yeah, just uh, just be be open, be flexible. Um, and just know that at under six, you are not going to control every part of that session. You know, if a plane flies overhead, which in Virginia Beach, it does happen quite often, admire the plane. Sometimes right. they're going to pick flowers. Sometimes they're going to jump over puddles. But there's no predetermined that that flower picker or plane watcher or puddle jumper at under six is, is not maybe going to be one of your best players at under 13. It's too early to tell. Right. So um, to summarize, Tom. Can your energy levels um, exceed theirs? Can you be silly and get into their world? And can you get down to their level? Love it, love it, love it. Um, Chris, what we're gonna do is we're gonna deep dive into um, your, I guess, your world a little bit more and the, the information, the education that you will typically provide people. Because I think, you know, for everybody that that's listening, um, some of the more practical examples and the specific you know, the specific nuances when it comes to, you know, coaching interactions or session structure or, you know, what should and shouldn't be included, I think is going to be really, really beneficial. So um, yeah. you you reference heavily clear, concise and correct information. What does that mean? What might it look like? You know, again, just can you kind of yeah. elaborate a little bit further? Yeah. yeah, just to things that shouldn't be included is line laps and lectures, right? Lines, laps, lectures, and then obviously language, poor language. Um, clear and concise and correct information. Um, it might be, you know, very simply, instead of giving a child an answer, I might say to a child, okay, what part of our foot can we make, uh, do we use to make a short pass? Show me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So then I can get in and make sure, and uh, I know that some parts of the federation is getting away from teaching correct technique, but now we can get down and teach the mechanics of the push pass, heel down, toe up, nod, kick and forth, et etc. Et um, you have to be, and, I, and I'll give you an example. So we play a little game called bring back and there's a young lad called Jack who was three years old. Jack's now 21 and he's at the air force Academy in, uh, in Colorado Springs. And I saw Jack for the first time in five years since moving away 
from Wisconsin and moving to Virginia. Jack, when he was three, we played a little game called bring back. And what I did was I threw the ball away. The kids, the children have to hand you the ball with two hands, part of safety, right? Instead of throwing at you and hitting you where you don't want to be hit. Um, he handed the ball to me with two hands and I threw the ball away and I said to Jack, Jack, bring it back using your imagination. Now, all the other children had gone and, and used different things and come back. And I turned around after about two and a half minutes and Jack's still standing there and Jack's going like this, <laughs> going. I said, Jack, what are you doing? He says, coach, I'm using my imagination, but the ball still won't come back. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you have to get into their world. You, your information in that term has to be clear. It needs to be concise and can it be correct? So, for example, what I should, could, should have said to Jack was, Jack, bring it back however you like and can you use your imagination while moving maybe <laughs> um you know but you know jack did what he was asked to do but Absolutely. the ball wasn't doing, <laughs> wasn't doing what you wanted it to all right so yeah. fascinating i think we all get caught out sometimes on semantics right and, and kids yeah. kind of receiving information completely literally and that yeah. you know ability to especially at these, these, in, uh, these ages to, to deal with kind of any abstract thought or, you know, yeah. maybe something that we assume as, oh, well, they, you know, it's, it's clear, it's understandable actually when, when they listen to it and you, and you relay it back, you're like, oh, maybe, maybe not actually. So yeah. it's definitely a humbling, a humbling process. You, um, you talk a lot, Chris, about um, obviously layering in early success and kind of building from, you know, from simple to more kind of complex activities, um, reasons behind that and kind of do's and don'ts. Yeah. So, you know, methodology is changing all the time, Tom, right? So the Federation likes us to start with small sided games, go to, uh, two activities, more challenging, less challenging, and then finish with a lar larger sided game. I think anytime we introduce something, it's got to be gradual to, so we can check for understanding. Um, so, you know, sometimes we've got to observe as coaches, we want to hear our own voice, but sometimes we've got to take a step back and just go, okay, what do they need? What do I, you know, I, I sometimes I think as coaches, we, we projectile vomit what we want them to learn, but they may not be ready to learn. In the words of John Wooden, we haven't coached until they've learned. Right. So I think. You know, if you can, for us, what a typical practice might look like is, is children arrive, it's a high five or a handshake. Um, we, we have a, a, a standard that we want their shirts to be tucked in. Yeah. Um, and then they join into small sided games. Once they've done that with their small sided games, we go to a tag game um, just for physical literacy, movement education, spatial awareness, all good things that children need, right? Balance. Um, and then we go into our practice where you might have a more challenging or a less challenging and then we finish with what the game would look like um you know so they, they know what it looks like when i first got here five years ago it would be the session would start at 5 15 the kids would show up at 5 15 the staff would show up at 5 20 so what we did was we didn't we made a simple change all we told parents is is if you want to get your children out there early at 4 45 the fields would be set up it will be adult supervision. There'll be balls out there. Um, we'll play in with your children. So we kind of um, really changed the culture because children were now telling their parents, hey, I want to go to training because right. we start with a game. Um, and whereas the two biggest questions you get at training is when's training over? And if you're getting that in the first two minutes, that's not a good sign. Or really? when, when do we play? When can right. we scrimmage, right? So it kind of eliminates a lot of those questions. Right. What we get now is, is, oh, is practice really over? You know what I mean? Um, and just by those simple things, by those simple things. And um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, your first point, the connection with with young children. Why the high five yeah. and the hand? So the uh, Reed Maltby, who's um, raising excellence. Right. He says high fives change lives. Um, the handshake was it, that is the rush way. Um, Okay. Just the handshake. It happens at Man United, a small club in England, if nobody's heard of them. Um, and, you know, I went there about 10 years ago and watched their academy. And he always starts with a handshake or a high five. And that's just having that connection. That is just um, elaborating on, you know, you're here now. This is your safe environment. 
go play, have free play. And, you know, we're here and it's just a point of contact per se, um, because we don't know what the, what the day's been like for those children, unless yeah. we ask them sometimes too, you know, it's an opportunity to walk out to the field and ask them how their day was, um, you know, pre nervous jitters. You know, we tried not to have a session on the first day of school because we felt that children are already going through enough having it, you know, summer ending and then first day of school. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, it's it's fascinating. And we actually um here in Jericho it was maybe two weeks ago and there was a noticeable, you know, we did train the first day of school and we got through the noticeable struggle, I think, both from a you know, from a mental, from a physical, um, maybe somewhat emotional perspective, there was definitely a um, a very visible difference. So, yeah, great, great little nugget of advice for people if we've if we've got the fortune of being able to to schedule sessions that way. Um, yeah, or or even maybe just have a check in. You know, how was school? What what, what yeah. you know? Make that more of a 10, 15 minutes because now all of a sudden is like, whoa, we had ten or fifteen minutes where we were able to talk our school day. Coach cares. Coach cares. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that was going to be kind of where I, where I went next. The, the handshakes and the high fives, I think, um, personal perspective, I think some people sometimes overlook the importance of just 10, 15, 30 seconds with a player and, and exactly what you referenced there, the ability to know them as a person and not just a player, um, yeah. and the ability to, to demonstrate interest. And... I asked a question once, and, and I don't know what you think about this. Maybe it's a little tougher with the very youngest, but you know, I phrased it in a way that was, "Tell me something that, tell me something I don't know about you that would help me coach you better." Yeah, yeah. No, that's brilliant. I think, uh, I think that's great. You know, we used we use that in a in our with our older players, right? G- you know, give give them give me one thing to help me coach you better. You wish yeah. I knew about you, and uh, you know. Uh, I heard Johnny O'Sullivan ask that question and I, and I, I you know, beg, borrowed, steal, magpied it, whatever. Yeah, and um, uh, I, I think it's great. You know, um, I think it's a, it's a good way of connecting. Um, we use it a lot on our select kids. Um, you know, when we bring kids from around the country, yeah. we put together, I put together a player profile based off um, what I thought it needed, but took some stuff from Bill Beswick's work focused in, so focus for soccer, the second edition, um, and uh, and then kind of pu- tried to pull that out. You know, favorite song, favorite pastime. Draw on, draw on memories of your best game. Um, draw draw on uh, dream game. So uh, experiencing thought process and what does that look like? Just little things. I think that's huge. I think it's it's very important. That's often overlooked. And I think you said something important there, Tom. Is first of all, we've got to know the person before we can reach the player and then that moves into performance how can we help them perform Absolutely. Um, and even at the youngest levels you know uh, where it's make believe you know I'll be honest on Tuesday it was it was really trying because our kids were bouncing off the walls all of them so I don't know whether it was the school lunches so in yeah. in rhetoric what I should have done was maybe play the tag game a little bit longer or got them into their games for a little bit longer, which we'll do tonight, to you know burn off some of that excess energy, um, and then get them back in, you know, because we have oh maybe eighty, six, seven, and eight year olds. Maybe it's going to be closer to one hundred and thirty tonight because we have our under sixes as well. So it becomes you know uh, we have to get that energy out to get the focus a little bit better. And as we build through sessions and the, the interpersonal relationships that you're discussing and, and obviously managing this um you know managing the energy sometimes managing the the good and the bad days um talk to me about what coaches can do in terms of how they interact so not just the process of interacting but the voice the language the tone yeah you know, your mannerisms you know, yeah how do you, how do you encourage people to you know, you, you discuss social safety and you know, obviously physical safety with the playing areas, yeah. but, but also emotional and psychological safety based on, you know, you wanting to, them to be lifelong learners or lifelong participants. Yeah. yeah. So having cues, for example, the louder they get, the quieter I get. 
in reverse, some people yell and shout, right? I, uh, I have a very simple thing, you know, clap once if you can hear me, clap twice if you can see me. And then I know that I've got their attention. I might say, uh, and again, put your hands on your head if you're looking, right? So now they might mimic me, but I'm trying to catch them out as well. Yeah. Um, and then I might even say, clap three times if you're being rude. And then we'll have a little giggle about it, you know? So I try and use positive uh, discipline. So for example, if there's a child that's got his shirt tucked in or her shirt tucked in and they have their foot on the ball and soccer ready, I might turn around and say, Brayden, thank you so much for having your shirt tucked in and being in soccer ready. And invariably, if there's children who are sitting down, they may stand up right away because children want to please. Sure. Um, and I've also, you know, probably about 10, 12 years ago, tried to eliminate, eliminate the word don't from my coaching vocabulary. And when I first did this, children who caught me saying don't were allowed to shout, coach, don't say don't. Do you know what I mean? So what we what that's made me do is think about language in a different way and promote the behaviors we want as opposed to what we don't want. Can you, you dig know? a little can you dig a little bit deeper in that? Because I, I think while obviously the this conversation is heavily centered around the you know advice for, for dealing with the youngest from a mm -hmm. cultural perspective, being very intentional about what you respond to, what you praise, what you eliminate, what you, you know, get checked back into line straight away if there's something yeah. that's, that's not going to be conducive well, to the culture. Yeah, so, you know, I'm, as you know, I'm going through my B license right now, so having to video sessions, right? Yeah. Um, the things that we tell our coaches to is if it's acceptable in the classroom, it's acceptable on the field. If we look at much of coaching, Tom, it is corrective. Yeah. Um, what I ask our coaches at all levels is be, de is be demanding without being demeaning. And can we connect first before we correct? I'm okay. trying to scribble down all of these little uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. quotes. Yeah. Imagine not demeaning. Yeah. And can you correct? Can you connect, sorry, before we correct? Before correct. Look at yeah. you. You're going to make yeah. a book of uh, Chris P's quotes. slogan. Yeah. yeah, well, they're not all mine. They're not all mine, but, uh, you know, they're just a few that have stuck with me. There's somebody at the door. <laughs> I'm listening to it. Can you hear it? Um, okay. So, um, you know, rephrase your question again, Tom, because I do want to go a little deeper with the question you asked and uh, not just give you quotes. And um, Yeah, so I, you're talking about positive discipline and, and emphasizing behaviors that you want to yeah. see within the culture that you create so yeah. my question is from a from a cultural perspective as a coach any age group and especially when you're dealing with the youngest players to expose them to what is expected of a player in in the rush program or yeah. just in general whatever your coaching philosophy may be can you can you provide any extra insight into you know into ways that you consciously do that, whether it's, you know, praising the process over performance, whether it's, you know, praising people being on time, whether it's, you know, what are, yeah. you, what are your ways of establishing and then maintaining a culture? Yeah, so I, I think I alluded to some of those earlier, right? But uh, children know they have a, um, it's a, their safe haven, right? I used to tell them in Wisconsin, uh, there was a worry tree. And as the kids came in, they could take their worries and hang them on the tree and come to training. Worry-free zone, just play, be your age, enjoy, relax. And then on your way back, we can walk back to that worry tree and you can choose whether you want to take that, those worries back off the tree and have a conversation about it or you can carry on about your day and stuff like that. So that's one little thing. Um, little things as well is children know when I'm calling them in, it's going to be bite-sized information at the younger ages because I don't want to talk for too long. And if they're const constantly interrupting, I'll say, okay, what, who's, what time are we wasting now? And they'll say, well, game time. Play time. Yeah. So they, yeah, play time, game time. So they know. Um, and then sometimes it could be a simple look, Tom, right? It can be a, you know, a look. You know, it might be the rhythm in my voice. It might be the, the tone of my voice. Um, you know, there's a 
dear friend of mine, Steve Davis, who believes in yelling is yelling. He doesn't shout because he can't shout very loud. So he, he says, tell one, tell all. So he might tell a player, that player tells the next player, um, and then the message is out, and then they're all in. Um, you know, so for example, when I'm trying to make a coaching point and I want everybody to come in, I might just say, can you be first? Mm -hmm. Instead of who's last, don't be last. It's can you be first? And the kids want to get in first and stuff like that. Um, you know, you have to know the players you're working with. You have to know the people you're working with. You have to know who's in front of you at every age. Um, you have to know the children that hide when you ask questions. Sometimes we have to cold call. So for example, might be, um, can anybody tell me, you know, what did we just work on? What did we want to see? Brilliant. Okay. Britain, can you build off Lavoie's answer? Yeah. So now I've just cold called that kid and now he knows, oh, I got to be on standby. Um, you know, so just being measured in the questions we asked as the, we ask as well. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, um, just being clear, a constant use of language. Um, which might be clear to you, um, but as I'm finding out going through my B license, it's not clear to everybody else, and you got to work on that, you know. Um, and as you know, I'm like you, very much like you. I, I'm a lifelong learner, and I want to get better. So I'm looking at different ways and open to different ways, and watching people and seeing what works as well. You know, these the things I've mentioned were a few things that have worked for me over over the years. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's wonderful and. Uh... Honestly, the, the the little nuggets of of insight based on you know the depth of experience that you have, I think is you know it's it's fascinating to listen to. So hopefully, obviously, everybody can can take little bits from this. Um, just to jump in a little, just just let me just add one more thing, right? So self reflection is big, right? So videoing yourself in your sessions and games is huge. Um, trying to stay constant. Are you a coach that says I'm going to give players ownership in training? And then on game day, you become a machine gunner, right? Yes. Um, and then I'm not sure if your work of Chris Cushion's work, um, where he oh, did. I'm, yeah. for, there you go. So you're ahead of the curve again. Um, you know, Chris Cushion has a brilliant YouTube talk on how coaches perceive themselves, but how their players actually see them. Um, so I think it's about 18% were correct in how they perceive themselves. So 82% was off, right? And we know, Tom, that 72.83 percent of statistics are made up on the spot but that's neither here or there um so i think the numbers are around there but just just those things right watch yourself video yourself get feedback from friends how am i coaching how am i looking am i walking the walk and am i talking the talk absolutely um, you know so let's let's talk about that you, you you mentioned am i a coach that wants to give ownership and allow players to make decisions talk to me about how coaches especially at the from the youngest ages up should you know should look to structure sessions or any you know any major recommendations for how they can go about that yeah so engagement it's got to be engagement right um and we talked about the structure of our sessions not to say it's necessarily correct um but i think the federation's onto something with the play practice play at the grassroots level um why because i think play is important um and i think what the federation's done is they're trying to recreate you know the fact that uh play is lost art right pick up games you know um they're not are not what they used to be because of times change parents change you know parents don't want to let their children out out their sight too far um so simply put i would do i would do a small sided game play based on their term interject every now and again um I personally go, would go to a tag game because we want to move, have those movement foundational skills. Children at six, five, six, seven, eight like to be chased and like to chase adults. Um, go into a practice where you can have more challenging and less challenging again, but that's where you got to know your players. Um, but also have in there, um, instead of, if you've got one V one and you've got a child who's ahead of the curve or an early developer, make that child play one against two. So it's, mm -hmm. there's an element of challenge in there, but there's an element of engagement um and has to think differently as opposed to the 1v1 um and then finish with small sided game again where you might be reinforcing what you did in the practice phase um so you might look at um dribbling you know hey uh you created an opening by dribbling love that um I, why did you do what you did so asking some 
why questions, but also letting children explore on their terms, not on our terms. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, look, it's, it's fascinating. I think it's so important when, um, you know, when we, when we see games taking place, as you said earlier, and, and the coach is the person that's at the center of it. And um, it just gets, it's interesting when it's, I, you know, we speak quite regularly about you can talk the talk, but do you walk the walk? Do your actions and behaviors reflect your, you know, the conversations that you have and the presentations that you give? Is it just words or, you know, is it is it actions as well? Chris, I don't know if you've tried this. Um, something we do quite regularly, we use uh, STA, we, we use um, a heavy games-based approach. So whether it's constraints, whether it's affordances, a lot of nonlinear pedagogy and, Obviously, the older players are more able to kind of deep dive into that concept. But um, something that, that we're fans of is giving the kids, we're playing a game as two teams and you've got 30 seconds, you've got a minute to come up with, you know, your solution to a problem, how you want to approach things, you know. And I think at all the ages, the skill in the coach is being able to facilitate learning, facilitate understanding whether it's through the structure of the game or through the small little nuggets of information they provide. Um, but doing that, I think, really does place the players in a position where they have to make decisions because it, we're not doing it for them. You know, it's, yeah. it's their game, it's, it's on them. Have you, have you ever tried anything like that? Is, is it something that you yeah, have seen? We, yeah, well, I do use a lot of games based. Um, and, and Tom, this is where I was really happy to go into my B license because I felt like I've swung the pendulum the other way. I used to believe X amount of time should be spent technical one player, one ball, technique, technique, technique. Um, but now we've got to be more cognizant of skill, which is the application of technique in the right context, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm a big fan of games for understanding. Obviously, with the B license, which you've gone through, the methodology now is you know, Wally warm up orientation, learning implementation. And yeah. in the orientation phase, our job is to set the problem for the focus team and manage the opponent command style to set the problem for the focus team to be able to, to recognize the problem. And then we have to help them in the, Absolutely. in the learning phase. Right. Yeah. So, but it's then being able to create that environment to make sure the problem that you're setting is correct. But then also giving players, we've got to know what solutions there's going to be, but then we've got to be open-minded because the players might find a different solution to what we were looking for, as opposed to this rigid, structured, well, this is the answer I wanted, however your way still worked. Right. You know, um, It just goes back to the old, um, if you go back to the 2002 World Cup, original Ronaldo, Brazilian Ronaldo, Ronaldo. right? Scored three goals with a toe poke. Yeah. Right? Finished with a golden boot with eight goals. How many times do you walk by on a Saturday and do you hear a coach say, don't use your toe? Right? Or, or use the inside of your foot to pass. Well, original Ronaldo and Luka Modric would never have survived in some of the environments that uh, are being created. Right? So our job, I think, is to be able to give children the right way or – the cor what's deemed to be the correct way, but then give them the freedom to, if they're still getting it done, then does technique really matter? Yeah, you know? if, they, if they can establish an appropriate solution to the problem, Yeah. who are we to tell yeah. them no, Yeah. right? So, um, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, Chris, you, you, you discussed a little bit earlier as well, players can come and, and the art of players being lost. Um, how many times have you asked kids to design games and, you know, yeah. show me, you know, I used to steal it on camps. You know, we, we, we both started our American journey on soccer camps and it yeah. used to astound me. Hey guys, go in a group of six. Here's, you know, you've got a selection of balls, yeah. cones, pinnies, whatever you do, make up a game. Yeah. Like, yeah. So brilliant. I, I'm glad you asked that question. So there's a, um, I do school visits. I'm not sure whether you know, but there's 55 elementary schools in Virginia beach. Okay. And um, about three or four years ago, we started a program, uh, just a community scheme where we go out to the schools, we take over the P classes all day from kindergarten through fifth grade, and we teach uh, football, soccer through the PE lessons. Yeah. And I would say to the PE teachers, 
Don't know how comfortable you are with your children, but I've got two approaches right now. One is very teacher led uh, and coach led, and we will take them through. The second one is we have got eight cones, eight players, one ball, four bibs, and we're going to ask them to design a game and see what they come up with. Are you comfortable with that? Do you think they can handle that? Um, the amount of teachers that said no was kind of astounding, but uh, there was a, quite a few that said, yes, let's go for it and see how they do. Um, so we do that quite often. Um, there's another instance. Uh, we started a training group, um, me and another director of coaching within the club, and we did it around the World Cup. Some of it was observation. Some of it was uh, presentation. Some of it was, uh, you know, we did presentation on attitude. And then for the last two sessions, we asked the players to design and develop and deliver a session for the last two sessions. So they came up with Fortnite football. And okay. I'll send I'll send you the videos. Please um, do. Yeah. They came up with Fortnite football and it was within a small sided game. So they they came up, they planned it, they performed it, they delivered it. Um, and we I ask players all the time, you know, OK, go away. You're leading this part of the session. But what do you want me to do? Whatever you want to do. Um, so again, giving them ownership, right? Um, so we, we do that. Um, uh, I, you know, when I did my teaching, um, teaching games for understanding was very big. Yep. So everything we tried to do was through a game situation. Um, and this is where I say that sometimes my pendulum swung too far to games based and I have to, you know, I, I've been quite fortunate, Tom, because I've been in games based, uh, for the last maybe four years um, and, you know, to semblance of whole part hall or play practice play, but the parents haven't really said anything. The kids keep coming back. The numbers that I'm dealing with kind of grow. So, you know, and parents don't get the amount of the, you know, I tell them, I, I share my philosophy and why. Um, and they're like, kids are smiling, kids are happy. And, you know, yesterday we had a, a kid who came 15 minutes late and one of the other children turn around to me and goes, you missed the best game ever. And it was, a, it was simply, and this was a, a coach I was working with. He was a math teacher. He had, we've got four teams, four goals, protect one, attack three. And the kids were just, and there was a couple of balls. So it was a frenzy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, but they loved it. They loved it, you know? Um, and it was very games-based and valuable. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, look, without wanting to sound too vested, and uh, and too biased equally in the conversation. Um, obviously, you know, games-based approaches and and maximising play opportunity is something that that we're you know highly in, encouraging of. Um, I think you know simply for for any coach listening, it's it's a humbling reality check when you when you think back and say, well, why are kids coming to play? Or why are kids coming to soccer? Yeah. They come to play, right? They, they, yeah. want, they, they don't want... They know, come to play at soccer. They come to play at soccer, yeah. yeah. Like, you know, yes, our insight is important. And yes, the way that we structure certain things can be important. But as you said earlier, you know, no lines, no laps, no lectures. It's not play. If those things are there, it's, yeah. it's not doing what they love to do. Um, Chris, I, I, I'm conscious, you know, I could talk for hours, but I, I'm going to... I'm you know, I can. I know. Yeah, it's <laughs> quite a combination right now. It's dangerous. Um, if you could, your your quota of shuns in a session, so your preparation, yeah. organization, can you can you break down um, the importance of, of those and link it to any more little nuggets of advice that you have for age appropriate session lengths? So you mentioned earlier you know, two seconds per year in terms of an attention span. Yeah. What should appropriate practice lengths be, in your opinion, yeah. for the kind of grassroots ages? Um, yeah. And, and obviously, how can you link that to, to your checklist of things that you think are needed in the session? Yeah, so just to go off the uh, length of practice. So for those of you that run under four programs, we found that 30 to 35 minutes um, is good, right? Um, and then for under sixes would be 40 to 45 minutes. An hour is a stretch, but if you're building uh, rest time because their um, their cooling system isn't fully developed and building, you know, uh, games of relaxation, important. Uh, under eights, I would probably go 60 minutes as well, twice a week. Um, under tens, I would go twice a week, three times a week, maybe. 
and go for 60 to 75 minutes and then the same with under 12s um, maybe it's a stretch at 90 minutes uh, but uh, you know the other things I would say is you know can we get them involved instantly can we make sure they're all involved no games of elimination um, and you know can we can we um, make sure that children are measuring themselves against themselves if we don't want uh, parents to come up to us and compare their child to a, another child and we all know that children in the same household are very different so mm -hmm. why would two ch children on a soccer team be a good comparison for parents uh, I don't think it's also a good comparison for children to compare themselves against someone else so yeah. using Mostyn slanty line theory where yeah, yeah. Um, everybody's measuring themselves against themselves right so can they see self-growth um, as opposed to the chuns this was from dr david carr as well who i know that stuff you know is very well um, yeah, yeah. Prepar preparation organization um, instruction explanation demonstration right one picture paints a thousand words um, correction if there needs to be correction in the technique and then evaluation and then certainly for the coach reflection right um, and players too so uh, preparation organization instruction explanation demonstration correction evaluation and the most important chin reflection yeah i i think it's um it's a wonderful place to to finish in terms of you know all those things that are so highly valuable and obviously the the example that you've given and and some of the stories in terms of the lessons that you've learned over the years and and how you know how it's impacted what you do now um and you know again as as always from from our perspective you know thank you so much for for the insight i'm i'm sure you know again i've got a page full of scribbles and, and yeah. i can talk with you anytime um yeah maybe we need to do a part two maybe we do need to do a part two and yeah. dive further um chris for the for the purpose of the listeners and and we'll certainly try and broadcast this on our end but if they want more information from you if you know can you how can they contact you how can they find you yeah um so Chris dot P A N A Y I O T O U 10 at gmail.com um, is my email address uh, at V A R Chris P is my Twitter handle seven five seven six three three eight three four six is my mobile number and uh, they can reach me anyway on the rush website as well I'm happy to, to help anybody I'm happy to listen to anybody who disagrees and and can maybe change my views as well um, so happy to do that uh, we also run some developmental webinars that they're welcome to join and get on it is for rush nation but we open it up to anybody who wants to be a learner and wants to listen to experts we've had experts like yourself on and and many others we're just plotting a few yeah, more things that. yeah um, but the the final thing I'd like to say Tom is is uh, children get one childhood um, and try not to be anybody's last coach. Very poignant. Yeah. Very poignant. No. Thank you very much for your time no. and sharing your thoughts, Chris. It's muchly appreciated. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for all you're doing and good luck in every endeavor. And I look uh, forward to working closer with you. Thank you, bud.